people might even think you're crazy for dreaming that big. It doesn't matter. It matters that you create a vision for your life and that you become a part of that vision and you take action every day to go after that vision and you feed your vision with positivity. And so that's what I did. Hello, Amberly, and welcome to the show. I am so excited, especially after that conversation, how hugely and highly we're aligned. I am so excited to chat with you. Knowing the amount of adversity that you have handled throughout your life and just experiencing our conversation and what a light you are, I am so pleased to share with my audience today. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Steph, for having me on. And I know we were talking for a while and I'm like, you're my new best friend. <laughs> so my, my I'm, spirit I'm, animal. <laughs> <laughs> so I am just like, it's such a joy to talk with you. And you know, I love your podcast and feel honored to be here. And my intention is to really share some of the lessons that I have learned along the way with all the adversity and the pain and trauma that I've experienced. So thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. It was just amazing. When you said yes, I just kind of was like, yay, she's coming. <laughs> so let's start off. So one of the things, Amberly, that I, 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 I don't like to do is I don't like to give people just regurgitated content and you are everywhere. Like you have been on so many shows, really huge shows. You've taken the stage in so many big arenas. I want to talk about the accident, but I also want to talk about the trauma, but I want to get as deep as possible for our audience. Tell me, you had such a booming and thriving career before the accident. Can you walk me through kind of like adolescence to the accident. And then let's talk about that a little bit before we get into the accident. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, my career, I did have a booming career and it, it was doing what I loved. So I grew up in a small town in Texas and I was a dancer and I ran track. In fact, um, it makes me so happy because my youngest daughter is now in track. I didn't ever want to like really push her into that, but I let it be her decision, but she's a really good runner and does hurdles. And to see her do that, it's like I set a record in the state of Texas for running the fastest mile. And so now my daughter is like racing every day around the house, which sometimes drives me crazy, to be honest with you. But, you know, I was an athlete and I think I honestly think the reason that I was so good. I can say I was so good at that. It's because I believe that your pain pushes you until your vision pulls you. And so I was trying to escape a lot of pain. So my parents divorced. And when my mom remarried, I was sexually abused by my stepfather. So I didn't feel like, although my mom is an incredible mom, we have a great relationship now. I didn't feel like I ever had a safe place and I had a lot of shame. And so what I did was I did things that made me feel better, which was I became a straight A student. I ran the fastest in track. I worked the hardest at the dance lessons and became, you know, was the youngest person um, in the dance company. I didn't want to be home. So I would stay at the dance studio. I would stay after school and, you know, run whatever it took just to make me feel better. And I think it's important to talk about, you know, it was great to have that outlet, but I did not realize till later in life that I literally ran from so many of my problems. But I decided at a young age when, you know, when MTV came out and all the music videos and the girls dancing on the videos, I was like, wait a minute, they get paid to dance. And I was like, you mean I could get paid to do what I love? And so I knew at that point that I wanted to move to Los Angeles and become a professional dancer. And I didn't have, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, my mom had five kids and then there were two stepkids. 
And there were days when we barely made it. There were Christmases when the only reason we were able to have presents under the tree was somebody from the church left some money on our front step. And so I knew if I was going to get to L.A., I was going to have to work really hard and save up some money. So I worked, gosh, I was working at the cookie jar. I was a lifeguard. I babysat. I scrubbed toilets. I cleaned my dad's office. I taught dance. I started teaching dance at age 13 and I saved up exactly $1,200. I had bought a little car, a Suzuki Samurai. And when I knew from when I graduated and I was telling everybody I'm out of here. And I think it was the pain that I was going through with the trauma of the sexual abuse and all that, that pushed me. But I had this vision that was pulling me. And so I didn't have a plan B or another option. I was like, I am going to make it as a dancer in, in LA. And so I moved to LA. Actually, I know you lived in the Bay Area. I lived in the Bay Area for a year and I was in a dance company and got a job working at two different restaurants and at two different studios right away. I didn't have parents that were like, let us fly you out and get you all set no. up. I mean, I was like, if I was going to make it, it was up to me. Um, and I worked my butt off. I didn't have a lot of people that believed in me or my dream. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to say for anybody listening that has a big dream and maybe doesn't have that, you know, support you're looking for, not everybody's going to believe in your dream. Sometimes people might even think you're crazy for dreaming that big. It doesn't matter. It matters that you create a vision for your life and that you become a part of that vision and you take action every day to go after that vision and you feed your vision with positivity. And so that's what I did. I took more dance classes than anybody because I was not the best dancer. And honestly, yep. Steph, I don't believe in talent. I mean, I'm proof of that. I was not the best dancer, but I worked really hard. And I believe that your hard work put you where your blessings can find you. And, um, you know, I had my stepmom saying, Oh, I think you're making a big mistake. And, you know, my mom was like, don't pack all your stuff. You'll be back in two weeks. Well, I was in LA for 31 years, had a successful career in dance, traveled the world. My first music video was dancing with MC Hammer. I did TV shows. I was sponsored by Nike. That transitioned to me going into the fitness business. I was doing infomercials. I was in shape. I was in health. I was nationally recognized as um, a fitness coach and everything changed in the blink of an eye when I had a horrible accident. And so that really was a moment that I realized my whole life, I had depended on my health and the way I looked. I know that sounds shallow, but I was booked no, for jobs. No, but you know what? Really, that I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you and I we may have been separated at birth. We possibly could have been separated at birth because everything that you're describing different but the same so I had a Middle Eastern family and I was supposed to go right into marriage and I didn't have a plan b got emancipated at 15 and a half was out on my own completely out on my own and they were like oh you're so cute you'll be back and it was my no, no plan b it was my number one thing to not ever come back which takes me to my next question Amberly. So do you believe, because this is a big, this is a big topic, you know, I had Claude Silver on and Mark Bowden on and, and, you know, a few other people that we've had this conversation. Do you think resiliency is innate or do you think you learn resiliency? I think that you can absolutely learn it. I think that all the struggles that we go through, all the challenges, and sometimes when you're in the middle of a challenge or you're working really hard and you're like, gosh, this sucks. Life sucks. Why is it so hard? There's always a lesson and a blessing in every challenge. And I can look back and I am so grateful for my past. Right. I am, you know, I'm, I, I really don't wish sexual abuse on anybody. I really don't wish, you know, a lot of trauma that I dealt with on anybody, but because I've done a lot of therapy, a lot of healing, a lot of crying, ugly tears, a lot of, you know, support, I can now share my experience with others. But yes, I believe that resilience is definitely something that is teachable and learnable. In fact, I had one of my best friends 
we were coming back from an event and because I have this nerve disease called complex regional pain syndrome, a, you know, I was told I'd be in a wheelchair forever. And there are some times at an event where I'm like, I just can't stand anymore. I got to get off my leg. Like I've got to sit because my leg feels like it's going to fall off. And so I told my girlfriend drove me and I looked at her and I was like, it's time to go. And we get in the car and she's like, you know, what is it that allows you to show up at events, to continue to get out of your wheelchair, to continue to show up every day when there's a lot of people that, that don't, they give up. She goes, you need to think about what the things are that you do every single day and start teaching that. And so that night at dinner, I looked at my husband and I was like, you know, he goes, you, you really need to slow down. You, you need to pace yourself. And I was like, I do pace myself. And it kind of pissed me off a little bit. I'm like, don't tell me to calm <laughs> down. Don't You're like, this is my pace. This, this is, is my pace. <laughs> I was like, do you know how much I got? You know, I got so much done today. But I started writing down everything I did. And I came up with, because I need something quick. Like, yeah. I, I like fast. I like a quick reminder. And there's a list I go through. I came up with something called Pacer. And it's what I do every day. And it's not like... It's not like resilience, you're resilient and all of a sudden you're resilient and life is easy. No, life is still hard sometimes. Life feels unfair sometimes. And so we have to constantly work on how to strengthen our resilience. And so I came up with something called PACER and it stands for perspective, acceptance, community, endurance, and rest. And if I'm doing these things throughout the day, then I know that I'm going to be able to be resilient enough to get through pain, whether it's chronic pain physically or chronic, you know, emotional pain, uh, whether it's anxiety or depression, or I'm just tired. I take a look at those things and I think it all starts with your mindset and deciding that you are going to be the victor of your life and not the victim. Because I was in a pity party for a long time. But once you decide that you are going to be an example of resilience, and I don't believe that we're a product of our circumstances. Mm-hmm. We are a product of our resiliency. I could not agree more. And, you know, when I was reading your story and I was looking through it, and I, I went through it quite extensively because I was telling you about Lila and the CRPS, and that was the very first time I had heard about it. And I did tons and tons of research. I can't tell you how many how much I scrolled you make no excuses. There's just, there's just no excuses. You're everything that you talk about on stage, on the Ted talk, everything else is. And also this is what happened. And you always figure out a way to spin it into something extremely thoughtful, intentional blessings, opportunities, whatever it is. And I so appreciate that because when you talk, Amberly, when you speak, it's so fluid and it's so not rehearsed, but it's so intentional and so from your heart. Um, and I think that that's something that our listeners can learn from because you have not had it easy. So I'm going completely off script right now. Did CRPS come before the the motorcycle accident or was it a result of that or is that something new? No, it was actually a result. So, um, you know, when I was on top of the world, like I was like, I have two failed marriages and I finally met the man of my dreams, two healthy kids. My career was booming. So I finally felt like, oh, I was comfortable. I felt good. And I had this motorcycle accident that changed everything. And being an athlete, you know, you were talking about, do you think we can learn resilience? And I think that being an athlete really taught me a lot about resilience. I had a my coach, my track coach and my dance teacher were my biggest mentors growing up. And I mean, there were times when I just did not like my coach at all or my dance teacher. They were really tough on me. You know, I'd be running on the track and... And my coach would be like, off the track to throw up, and then you keep running. My dance teacher would be like, I don't care if your toes are bleeding in your point shoes. The show must go on. So I had this mentality of, you just push through. You suck it up. You cowgirl up. You get her done. Pull up your bootstraps and no excuses. And I thought, you know, I had 34 surgeries to save my leg from amputation, which was like a miracle. I had a 1% chance of saving my leg. 
And we finally found a doctor who was willing to take that chance with me. And so surgery after surgery, I got through with a lot of grit. And by the grace of God, I didn't have an infection. I had friends and family that were showing up for me at the hospital. And I thought, okay, well, the pain's going to get better. It's going to take a while. I've pushed through pain before. Things are going to get easier. I'm going to heal and I'll get back to being a trainer. And I remember, you know, I had a doctor told me, well, it's going to take two years for you to walk again. And I was like, he doesn't know me. Like, he does not know who I am, obviously. So anyway, at like three and a half, four months, I remember I had a friend come over, one of my best friends that was another trainer that I worked with. And he goes, he goes, why is one of your legs a different color than the other one? And I was like, I don't know. All I care is it's not infected. I'm healing. I don't know why my leg is purple. Anyway, I had this appointment with this doctor and I thought he's going to be so proud because I'm finally upright on my crutches when they said it'd take me two years, but I was standing upright on my crutches. I was in extreme pain but I have a high tolerance for pain and I was pushing through. I show up at this appointment. This doctor takes one look at me and he runs out the door. And I looked at my husband and I said, well, that's not the reaction I was expecting. And he comes back in. He goes, you know what? You've got something really serious. And I was like, uh, duh, I got hit by an SUV. <laughs> they wanted to amputate my leg, but look, they saved it. Here I am. So give me the scoop. What do I need to continue to get better? He goes, no, 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 no. You've got complex regional pain syndrome. There is no known cure for this. You need to go home and get back in your wheelchair. And I was like, okay, for how long? And he goes, forever. He goes, you're going to be permanently disabled. You'll never work again. And you'll probably have to wear orthopedic shoes. And I was just like, you're like, I'm not having that. I am not. You're like, that, that right there is all I need to know. Oh, I that am is not, not happening. That. But you know what, <laughs> Steph? Just yesterday, I have some old boots that I wear to work out in, to walk in. And the sole had worn out on them. And I had them resold because there's only certain kind of shoes that I can wear. Yeah. And it messed them up. I can't wear them. It started to flare me up. So that doctor was right in some aspect. Like, I have to look at the shoes I wear. That's why I work out in boots and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, it was a result of the accidents. It's caused by trauma. So whenever they said that they were going to amputate your leg and you said, nope, that's not going to happen, would, did they leave the decision to you or was it a team or how did it, how did it to, let's talk about that. Yeah. So I was in a coma and they wanted to go ahead and amputate it right there at the hospital. And and my husband was like, nope, you're not going to amputate it. I want her to wake up out of a coma with both of her legs. I want that to be her decision. And so waking up out of a coma, I don't suggest it. You've got tubes going down your throat. They like Vaseline your eyelids because it's crazy. And the first thing I learned was that they said, well, you know, this is basically a war wound. There's nothing we can do for you. We're, I'm sorry, we're going to have to amputate, but you know, you only have a 1%. And that 1%, I was like, oh, well, then there's still a chance. That was, oh, you said one, there is a chance. That's what it's like I like that Dumb and Dumber on. movie. It's the Dumb and Dumber movie where he's like, when will we go out? And there is a chance. And if so he goes, there's like, a chance. What is it? <laughs> exactly. So there's a chance. And she's like, what the? That's so crazy. So when you were going through all of this, because again, it was so extensive and it was so painful. And also not only, I mean, taking nothing away from from your athleticism taking nothing away from how hard you worked as a dancer but just an average joe person that would be impossible amberly impossible but somebody who had made their entire life their entire business their entire being their identity is an athlete is a dancer to have this happen were you mad at god no i wasn't mad at god it's it's crazy because that's such a good question because when I wrote my book, the editor, I would write and the editor would edit it and give it back to me. And there was one day I had written something and he, he gave it back to me and I was like, what the hell? You added a bunch of stuff about me being so angry at the guy that hit me. I was like, that's not me. I wasn't angry in the hospital. I said, I didn't, I didn't have time to be 
angry. I had to focus on what I could do every single day to get through that day in the healthiest, strongest, most resilient way possible. And anger wasn't a part of that equation. I had to focus on what can I do to get through? What can I, cause I was like there, I, I was spiraling down into depression. Um, because I, I, I had this moment where I was like, I looked down at my leg. I was like, Oh my God, it hit me. Like, what if my husband doesn't love me anymore? What if I can't chase Mm. after my kids? What if I don't, I am going to be all scarred up. What, what if my husband doesn't love me? What, like all these what ifs. And then I was like, what if I die in the operation? What or all these things? But I wasn't angry at God. In fact, it was by the grace of God that really helped me. I prayed every day. I had a team of prayer warriors and my guardian angels were working overtime. I wasn't angry at God, but there was a point um, when I kind of turned my back on God, not just God specifically, but everything, because I was trying all these different treatments um, for pain. Like I, man, when they diagnosed me, they're like, we need to take radical action. So I was like, okay, I was doing spinal blocks and I was doing ketamine infusions, which weren't covered by insurance. So we borrowed money from a friend and paid him back, you know, on with interest. But it was very, it was $20,000 for that. Like we were spent, I had $2.9 million worth of medical expenses. We had a lien on our house. Like I was broken in every way. And I was trying Eastern Western medicine at one point, Steph, I was on 73, I counted them, 73 homeopathic pills and 11 prescription medications and nothing was working for the pain. Cause this nerve pain is ranked highest on the pain scale. I was trying to stuff it down. I was trying to get through it. And I remember I discovered having a glass of wine helped me numb it out a little bit. And I was kind of like, wow, dang, why didn't the doctors just tell me, open up a bottle of Cabernet and you'll numb that pain right out. And so when I started doing that, it worked until it didn't because it completely numbed me out in every way. It cut off my spiritual connection to my higher power, who I call God. It shut me out. My world was really big And it started getting smaller and smaller and smaller until, you know, it makes me cry just thinking about this. Here I was. These doctors saved my leg. My husband stood by my side. And I was slowly killing myself with alcohol just because I was in so much pain. So... I didn't turn my back on God. He was always there. I just had to ask for help. These are tears of like joy because... Well, because you're able to reflect and think back and go back to go, it wasn't him that I was turning my back on. It's it's the frustration and the fear of trying every single thing and putting in your head, putting everything in jeopardy. Like the kids don't have their mom in full effect. Your husband is trying everything. You feel like everything is on him and you keep trying and keep trying and you're not giving up. It's like, how much longer do you have to go? Like how, when is your strength run out? And not for you, for everyone else that you're trying so hard for. Yeah. And you know, I was the breadwinner of the family. Um, you know, my oldest daughter, uh, her dad and I were divorced when she was only a year old. And I had always been her rock. Like I Mm. was always the one that was there for her and she was going into high school. So it was just all so much and so big. My youngest daughter was two at the time. She had just turned two. And, you know, if you're listening and you're struggling with something, if you can take one thing from this interview today is ask for help. I, I think, you know, we heal what we reveal and I was Mm -hmm. so busy shoving it down, stuffing it down, trying to numb out just so I wouldn't sucking it up, sucking it up. Yeah. And you know what? 
suck it up doesn't always work. It can get you right. far, but until you let those feelings rise to the surface and deal with them, it will come out in everything you do, the way you love, the way you lead, the way you parent, everything. And so it was when, uh, out of sheer desperation, um, shame, just wanting, I wanted to die. I was like, I can't, I knew that I couldn't continue living the way that I was living and I wanted to die, but I was too afraid to die and I didn't want to do that to my daughters. And so it took every ounce of courage in me to ask for help especially because I asked from a client. I asked a client who was sober and I was always that go-getter, the successful one The you know, I was never a partier. I was the one while all my friends were out at the bars, I was busy collecting their tips. And so to, it, there was so much shame to go from this successful career fitness person to I'm drinking wine every day. What the hell? How did a good girl like me end up like this. That's what I was. It was that victim mentality. Like, Oh, woe is me. And I was like, screw that. I'm going to be the example of resilience to my daughters. I don't want them to grow up thinking that this is how they have to leave, live their life just because something bad happens. And so I decided I asked for help. And I will say that person that I asked for help from, she was like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to help you. And I didn't hear back from her for a week. And so I was like, okay, I got to help myself. And so I started Googling like recovery meetings. And so I share that because sometimes you might ask for help and they might have the best intentions of helping you, but they just aren't capable or they're busy or life is life or whatever. You have to be willing to help yourself. And so that willingness and deciding and just being humble enough to ask and to, to move forward. And there is a gift in desperation. And so if you're struggling, ask for help, but be willing to, to step up and help yourself. So it's so interesting that you say that. I want to highlight for our listeners. Um, one of the biggest things that I coach, one of the biggest things, and I actually start with it, is using the same dictionary. So you're oh my gosh, everything may not be somebody else's everything. That's number one. Number two, number two, when strong people that have never asked for help before, when they ask for help, most people don't hear a sense of urgency because we don't share a sense of urgency. We say, hey, you know what? Is there any way you could help me with this? And that sounds maybe like next week or the week after or maybe this month. But they don't know because we've never asked for help before. Meanwhile, we're white knuckling it. Oh, you know, we're yeah. Like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? But they don't hear it from us. And for me, Amberly, that caused a lot of resentment for me where I was like, I never ask. And these are the people that go, hey, Steph, if you ever need anything, you know, reach out. And when I finally get up enough nerve to do it, when I finally do it, I felt ghosted and I wasn't ghosted because to your point, she just needed to finish the things that she was doing, but didn't communicate that to me. Um, and I had to, I had to do it myself and, and I did it wrong a couple times and then I figured it out, but it was me. I was the cause of it. I had never asked for help. I didn't necessarily explain the situation or the severity of the situation. And, and I was desperate and I didn't say I was desperate. And so she thought that there was, there was a little bit of, buffer and timing and it, it maybe wasn't. <laughs> That's such a good point though. But usually when a strong person who never asks for help, and I was always the person who everybody else went to, to help them. Same, same. Um, usually when you finally summon up enough courage to ask for help, it's like, you're really hanging on by a thread. You really yes. need help. And, you know, it's funny because I told my grandmother, who's amazing, she's 95 and she's just, I, I want to be like her. She's my biggest role model. And I said, Granny, you are so strong. And she said, yeah, you know what, Amberly, but it's hard to be strong all the time. And it's like, you know what, we don't have to be strong all the time. Like, it's so important. You know, I got all emotional earlier and I used to be really like embarrassed to be emotional or vulnerable. I didn't cry because it was my defense against my stepfather for so long. So he would, 
at the same time sexual abuse me, he would emotionally like break me down, break me down, break me down until he'd be like, ha, see, I knew I could make you cry. And he would laugh. And so for years, I didn't cry. I was just, I didn't cry. I stopped crying because that was my defense. So when I got sober back in 2019, I think I ugly cried for like a year straight. All those emotions that I had stuffed down all started coming up and it was hard. Um, but now like I cry at a, a, a commercial on TV, you know, I cry when someone else shares with me what they're going through. And, you know, our daughter, <laughs> Our youngest daughter, Ruby, might need therapy because my husband's a lieutenant commander with a CHP. Well, he just retired, but um, she'll cry about something and he'll be like, don't cry, suck it up. And I'm like, Ruby, you cry. You let it all out. Come here. Let, let it out, you. girl. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, it's actually, Amberly, it's so, it's, it's amazing that you say that because that was, again, you know, same as you. Um, you know, survivor of sexual abuse and all of the things that we've both gone through, you know, at the, at the same, the same things in different points of your life, as you evolve, as you become more savvy, it's freeing. And so I would always think strong people don't cry. Um, uh, people that have evolved, they don't cry. Leaders don't cry. And I got to a point where I had some really amazing people around me and they said the strongest connection the most empathetic, self-aware connection cry the most and are the toughest and strongest leaders because they are the ones that are able to see what other people are going through and not not react, but respond in a careful, leading, respectful, kind manner. It may not be what they always love or that they say, oh gosh, this was the best thing in the entire world, but is what it is what those gr that group actually specifically needed. Letting your heart out when you said that about the, the commercial, my daughter was laughing at me because there was an AT&T commercial and the dad surprised the son in coming home early from, from the war and seeing that 17 year old boy, man, nearly a man drop to his knees and say, daddy, I literally just, I burst it I, and everything was fine that day. I was like cooking and in the garden and everything. I was like sobbing, looking at the TV. I'm like, wow, I really need help. <laughs> Steph, I love all that you share. You are so amazing. I can't wait to have you on my podcast. I feel like I could just listen to you all day long. So it's no wonder that you have this incredible booming podcast and an audience that just adores you because you're so amazing. And, and to all your listeners, I just feel honored that I get to spend this time with you. And, and y'all, she talked to me and is like the most loving, caring, empathetic, supportive person off air as she is right now on air. Like you are the real deal. And that like, that's such a treasure. So I'm just so grateful for you and all that you share. Um, and yeah, I feel like we, we may have been separated at birth because we've gone through such similar situations. Although our stories are different, there's such right. a, a, a common thread. That is such an amazing, amazing compliment. Thank you so much, Amberly. It means so much to me. That that for me is the entire reason, the inspiration, the impact, and and the the authenticity of just being able to share and the vulnerability to be able to say, hey, you too, you know, me too. Let's come together and heal through it. Like just like you said earlier, you know, you can't heal what you don't reveal. You cannot get through. There's no way around it. You may think you're going around it. You may think that you are all good because you went around it. I swear to you, it will come back unless you work on it. Like I believe it wholeheartedly, no matter if you're a teenager, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're 50 or if you're 70, if you talk to any 95 year old person who's talking about their life, they will tell you, don't sweat the small stuff. Don't take yourself too seriously and walk through it. Don't go around it. So thank you so much for that. Can we talk about the book? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm <laughs> so excited. So a large portion of your audience is made up of entrepreneurs. And the title of your book, you've truly found a way to turn tragedy into triumph. But here's what I want to know. Because this is this is often for me. So this is not for you listeners. This is only for me. So don't listen. Um what made you sit down and write this book? And were you scattered? Like, were you scattered or did you just go, I'm, I know what I'm doing? Oh my God, I didn't know what I'm doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. I'm just <laughs> figuring it out along the way. 
I, and you know what, Steph, I will tell you that when I decided to write a book and I, I shared this with you when we first got on the, the podcast, I, I was like, I'm a little technically like figuring things out. So I appreciate your patience. Five years ago, I didn't even own a computer. I was, wow. I lived my whole life on the dance floor and then the gym floor. So I didn't, all of my business was through word of mouth. I did all my invoice stuff. I was old school. I did it by hand. I didn't own a computer. I decided to write a book and I had people saying, oh yeah, you're the fitness girl. Stick to that. Like, you know, my husband was like, well, you don't even own a computer. And so I didn't have like, cause they had never written a book. They're like, I don't know how you're going to do that. But let me tell you, I hand wrote probably 80 to 90% of my book. I had doubts. I had moments of who do I think I am? Who's going to care about my a book or what I have to say? But I kept going and I, I didn't focus on how am I going to write a book? I focused on why and why is because I knew there had to be somebody out there struggling the way that I was struggling. And if I could be their glimmer of hope to keep pushing forward, to not give up, then that was my why. So I thought if I can, I mean, if I really can impact one person, it will give my pain purpose. And so I kept writing. I went to Apple. I bought myself a laptop. I didn't even know how to like attach a picture to an email. I remember going to a girlfriend's house and I'm like, I don't know how any of this works. I took um, a, a class at the Apple store and the guy was like, I just have to stop the class for a minute because I've never had anybody raise their hand with questions as much as you like, you're not embarrassed to ask all these basic questions. And I'm like, no, I'm not embarrassed. I need to learn this because I need to get this out there. And so I took a writing class from uh, an incredible teacher in Los Angeles. And I found a, a publisher and they said, we don't do any marketing or branding for you. So if you want to get your book out there, that's up to you. And so Steph, I was like, okay, I got to figure social media out. And I had an Instagram account just basically to stalk my oldest daughter and see what she was right. doing. And I started posting and just delivering value. And I had a goal. My book was coming out. It was like a year long pub, you know, process. And I had a goal. I want to get to 10,000 followers on Instagram. I don't even like to say followers. I like to say friends, but anyway, that way you could do a swipe up. And so I had that goal. Mm. Well, I grew my Instagram and you know, everything in perspective, right? Because some people might not think this is a lot. But when I've worked my butt off to get it to this, I, I had like a couple of maybe, I don't know, a couple of dozen, <laughs> I don't know, followers, nothing basically, to now it's 177,000 followers. And I'm verified my book became a bestseller in three categories. I took a screenshot of the day it came out was right in between two of my favorite authors, Brene Brown and Dr. Wayne Dyer. I was like, oh my God, every bookstore across the country, I went on a book tour that I arranged. I called every bookstore, set up a book signing. I, with my own money, got on an airplane, showed up at the bookstore, promoted it on social media and sold out. I was at Books and Books in Miami and they afterwards were like, and this is a place where celebrities go, politicians go, it's huge. And I got a book signing there and, and they said, we have never sold out of books. We've had huge people. We've never sold out like you sold out just like that. That is the power of social media. And I am only sharing this with you because if somebody like me that doesn't have a college education, that didn't even own a computer, um, can write a book, get, get it to be a bestseller. It helped a lot that I was on the Today Show the day that it launched that Megan Kelly wanted to interview me. If I can do that, you can do anything. You just have to create that vision for you, become a part of that vision, seek counsel, not opinion, 
and feed that vision with positivity and take action steps every day on goals that you've set up with a date in mind and be accountable and you can do anything. So you are such an incredible inspiration. Um, there's a ton of inspirations out there. We've talked about this. There's a lot of people, okay? But the your openness and your willing to share, your no plan B, which is something that I preach from, you know, I, I can't even tell you. I scream it from the rooftops. No plan B because then that's an option to fail. No plan B, period. Your resiliency, your tenacity, your grit. But you know what? How graceful, how beautiful, how accomplished, how genuine you are. It is such an incredible gift. I am so, I, I'm over the moon that we were able to have this conversation and I can't tell you how much it means to me. I know that we'll be friends forever. Like I am just so excited. You know, the show is all about opportunities, opportunities and excuse me, obstacles and opportunities. What is the biggest obstacle that you faced that you've been able to turn into a blessing or opportunity? Um, I really believe that being diagnosed with CRPS, I mean, that 34 surgeries is hard. It's a lot to get over. Sexual abuse was hard. Oh. And you, st I feel like it's a continual, you know, you peel the layers. It's con you yeah. think you're over it and something triggers you and you're like, Ooh, where'd that come from? I think the hardest obstacle that I've ever dealt with and continue to deal with, and I've had to change everything from my mindset to my spiritual connection to how I work out and move my body to everything I eat is being diagnosed with CRPS and pain has been my greatest teacher through it. I have learned to love myself because I really, you asked me if I was mad at God. No, I was mad at myself. I was mad at my leg. I hated the way I looked and hates a four letter word in our family, but I hated that my leg was deformed and didn't work properly. But with the pain, I have learned to give myself grace, to give others grace. I've learned patient. Well, I'm still learning patience, um, <laughs> self, true self love. Um, and I've, I've learned more grit and because it's not like I have gotten through this and now everything's great. I never know when this, I, I would describe it. And I thought of this yesterday coming home from the grocery store. So I was really trying to wear my old boots that had been resold and it was really flaring me up and I was limping around and I thought, man, I try not to limp. And I was like, you know, it's like living with CRPS for me, it's in my right leg. It's like a, a monster that lives in my right foot and leg. And if I poke it, it wakes up and it just comes at me with a vengeance. And sometimes that pain just wants to take over. If I don't take steps through, like I, I like to say, the pacer method, the perspective, shift my mindset and not focus on like how awful things are, but how grateful mm. I am to be able to walk right. and go to the store for so long. I was bedridden being an acceptance, radical acceptance for where you are on your journey. So you can take action steps, community. Like you said, we're going to be best friends. Um, the, the community you have, I used to think that I had to do everything alone. We are together. Yeah. We're unstoppable. It's powerful. The endurance, that's when I tap into my why. That's when your grit and your perseverance really comes into play. And then finally, the last part that's so hard for me, Steph, I'm still learning, but I'm learning, is rest. And I've really made rest a part of my business strategy. I even have this like aura ring on. I've had to make it like I'm very competitive with myself. Like, um, like I want to do better than I did yesterday. And I say competitive with myself because I can be real hard on myself, but switching resting to a business strategy, I wake up and I look at this app that tells me how much REM sleep I got, how much deep sleep I've gotten. So I, that's really helped me. But in order to be resilient, I think that sometimes we need to strategically stop and right. plan things in our schedule. I mean, look, I'm old school and I have this like old school calendar that I write down. Oh, see, there you go. I got it. I got you. <laughs> I have an app and a calendar, but I like to feel it. I like the writing and the Me checking too. it off. I like the checking it off. 
It makes me happy. And I check them off in different colors too. So you'll totally like, here's my check off, like all the way different colors. Oh my gosh, girl, we are so much alike. <laughs> you would not believe this. Yeah. Yeah. See, my, my daughter thinks I'm absolutely insane. She's like, yeah, you know, that's called neurotic. And I go, no, that's called organized. <laughs> Yeah, it makes me feel better. I go to bed, so I start my day with a checklist, and I go to bed, I brain dump and put everything, like, so I don't have to think about it when I get in bed. I just brain dump it. It's there, so I won't forget it. I don't have to remember it. I don't have to reprocess it in my mind. Yeah. That's amazing. Amberly, who should buy your book? Who's it for? You know what? I've had... I've had people that have reached out to me that have chronic pain that are like, wow, this is the first time I have hope since I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia or CRPS um, or cancer. I've had women that have whispered in my ear at the school PTA meeting thanking me for writing about sexual abuse, abuse because they've walked in shame for so many years and it gave them permission that they needed to give them themselves to walk with their head held high and their shoulders back and that that didn't define them. And then I've had other people that I just had a message this morning. So I have a community text number and I had a message from a girl who is getting treatment for um, CRPS and she's like, I listened to your Audible book and I feel like you were talking to me and it's your voice that is cheering me on to get me through these really difficult treatments. And so it's really a book for anyone who's struggling and just needs that glimmer of hope. It is a call to your courage. That cheerleader, that person that's just right there, your support, your love, you know, that's amazing. Mm, Thank you. Yes, of course. And I expect I get a signed copy of it from you. Yes, and a hug. I want to go visit you or come to Dallas and see me. I will be there super soon. Tell me, tell the audience where they can find you. Where can they find you? Where can they follow you? Where can they learn more? Okay, you know what? Text me. I had somebody reach out today and say, oh my gosh, I really have access to you. Yes, it's me texting you back. So sometimes it might take a day or two to get back to you because it's me. But you can text me the word GRIT, G-R-I-T, just that word, to 818-214-7378. And that will give you that downloadable, free downloadable playbook that walks you through the PACER method. Because I don't want you to just be inspired. I want you to take action. I want you to take this tool and apply it to your life so you thrive. Not just survive, but thrive. Um, you can find me Instagram at Amberly Lago Motivation and see some of the behind the scenes shenanigans. AmberlyLago.com is where you can find my podcast, True Grit and Grace, and my book, True Grit and Grace. Um, but yeah, reach out. And y'all, like, take a screenshot of Steph's podcast because it's she's freaking amazing and she delivers so much value through her podcast. Review it. Take a screenshot of it and tag us. If you tag me on Instagram, I will I'll ta- I will share it in my story. So, thank you so much, Steph, for having me on. I just I love your podcast, and it's been so awesome getting to hang out with you. I just don't want this to end. <laughs> I know. I'm so excited to do it again really, really soon, and I can't wait to have you back on the show. And I can't wait to get together with you in Dallas. So, thank you again so much. Thank you.